I'd like to invite um, Bill Thompson up. Um, I heard Bill just last week at uh, the Digital Minds Conference, which was the one-day event uh, immediately before the London Book Fair. Um, he had a spot uh, speaking after Anthony Horowitz, the, the author, uh, and I thought that was going to be a hard act to follow. And I have to say he, that Bill's session was actually even more interesting and thought-provoking than that of Anthony Horowitz. Um, and I was struck yesterday by... Um, if, I don't know... You'll have seen Ernesto's um, picture of publishing where content goes to die that seems to have gone viral on Twitter. Um, and it, it, it brought back to mind something that Bill had said about um, uh, the printed book being, still being the center of certain people's universes, sort of a pre-Copernicus idea. Um, and he, I know he's got a philosophy background, and he, he came up with this um, idea of a printed book is essentially furniture. But, uh, <laughs> um, just to introduce Bill, he's Head of Partnership Development in the BBC's Archive Development Group, uh, visiting professor at the Royal College of Art, and he appears weekly on Click on BBC World Service Radio. Um, prior to that, he's uh, had a long and distinguished career, including uh, going to the Guardian newspapers as Head of New Media and established that paper's first website in 1994. Um, and he's also been involved in other online projects such as Euro Soccer in '96. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Bill. Thank you very much. It's, it's lovely uh, to see you all here. It's quite an intimidating venue. Um, sort of makes you feel you want to grandstand. So, so if I just go a bit over the top, please forgive me. Uh, you don't often get a chance to, to fill the space with sound. Um, I call this talk The Open Library and Its Enemies. Uh, and it's uh, extending some thoughts I've been working on for quite a while. I'm a, an advocate of open systems and open software and the open web and openness and all things. Uh, and as those of you who believe in open access and open systems know, it's a complex area. Uh, and what I want to do is to explore my thinking in the context of the work of people like Karl Popper in the past and his debates about the open society and its enemies, hence the riff there. Um, and obviously, in that, I'll talk quite a lot about the internet as a, a network for moving bits around. Uh, not just because I think the net is actually important, but because I think that it allows us, it's a lens through which we can view lots of other things. And I'll talk also about a library and libraries as nodes in the information network uh, and the continuing importance of the library. Not just as places where we can deposit the furniture of the books in our lives, I still think books are very important. They are still machines for moving ideas around, but they do sit nicely on shelves, unlike bits that are stored on information systems. And we'll explore some of, the, some of that as well. I'll also talk about the World Wide Web, but as we know, the web is just a thing that sits on top of the internet. And, and for me, the web's one application among many that we can put the network to. And I don't want to stress its importance too much because I think it's easy to get distracted by that. Uh, the web may come and go. The ability seamlessly to exchange data, the ability to link all of our computers together is something that won't go away whatever happens. So the internet has actually been with us a very long time. Uh, this is the log from one of the very early precursors of the internet, the ARPANET. This is an imp log in 1970 showing when we first started to connect our computers together. And sometimes it surprises me that we're still talking about all of this stuff, that we've had computers, you know, digital computers for 70 years. We've had the internet for 30, we've had, you know, the iPhone is seven years old, and yet we still seem to wake up every morning surprised that digital technologies have affected our lives. And that either expresses a very deep conservatism, or it's that many of us are spending time ignoring the reality that the world has already changed, and we're just trying to keep up with it. Now, let's not forget that this is a magical device. With this device, I can type in 12 numbers and have a conversation with any one of about 4 billion living human beings. That's just the phone use of it. That this was conceivable 20, 30 years ago amazes me. That it's also a very powerful digital computer that is permanently connected to the internet and gives me access to those bits of the world's knowledge that Google has currently got around to indexing. Very small part of it. Um, is also impressive in, in, in another way. So we shouldn't forget just how 
surprisingly wonderful the world that we find ourselves living in is, and it's, it's easy to lose track of that. Within that world, open data matters, and it matters to me enormously. It's data that can be used and reused and distributed by anyone for any purpose. And I think the, the term open is far too easy to, to slip away from, to, to lose the significance of that word. But it's not, oh, you can do this with it, it's reasonably open. It is open. It can be transformed. So an open library is one that supports all of those uses, one that's not just accessible, but permeable and machine-readable, one, one that offers itself as more than just a passive catalogue of holdings. And that's what you've been talking about for the past three days. The talks I was listening to this morning make it very clear that you are all fighting very hard to make that into reality. And these libraries matter. All of the nodes in the information society matter because they help bind us all together. They help make it possible to find and access data, to turn it into information and knowledge, and to transform society as a result. And I think that what's been happening with open data takes us beyond the model of society and politics that was first put forward by Karl Popper back in 1945 in the Open Society and His Enemies, and allows us to develop his thinking in a way that can take account of the capabilities of the network, the things that we can do now, the power of the technology that's in all of our hands. So I want to look at the impact of the internet and how it resonates with me in my life and in yours. To some extent, to a large extent, the internet is an experiment. It's a massively unregulated experiment in openness and sharing that nobody really anticipated. It's as radical in its import as the end of the Cold War. When the Berlin Wall was opened up, the East Germans and West Germans did not really know what was going to happen, what impact that would have on geopolitics. It was a massive risk. Creating the internet is similarly a massive risk because we're starting to allow the unimpeded flow of data and information between individuals, between organizations, and we believe that making it as open as possible is a good thing, but we haven't really anticipated the risks. We haven't really started to measure the benefits. We don't necessarily know where we are going to end up. We're living now not in a digital age, but in the age of electronics. Most of the transactions that most of us in the developed Western world have in our daily lives are mediated in some way by the flow of tiny circuits through ti uh, tiny, um, uh, by the flow of electrons through tiny circuits. We're not digital. None of us has transformed ourselves into the cloud. We haven't uploaded our consciousness. Well, I certainly haven't uploaded mine, and I don't think that's ever going to happen, whatever Ray Kurt Kurzweil may say. But we do rely on the capabilities of these electronic devices to make lives possible. This room would not be possible without those electronics. Your presence here would not have happened. The trains we traveled on, the cars that many of you will drive in, have more electronics in them than they do steel these days, if you measure the value. A car is basically a computer on wheels these days with an engine attached. So we live in this world, and we observe just some of the wonderful things they've done, the way they have transformed people's lives. This is an M-Pesa uh, um, kiosk in Kenya where they've had digital money, digital cash, for several years now, where you can move money between mobile phones by sending a text message in a secure way. And it provides an alternative to a cash economy and a banking economy for people who don't have access to the facilities that we might expect to find in the high street. So even those who live in poverty are being affected by the capabilities. And it's all really good and it's all fantastic but it comes at a price it comes at a very significant price the guardian and um, the uh, new york times got the pulitzer prize just a couple of days ago for the work they did in publishing the material that had been should we say liberated by edward snowden and what that demonstrated was that as we rely on the network it's also watching us that those who would seek to take away our freedoms by perv through pervasive surveillance have in their hands tools that can be, very, can be used against us and are very powerful. 
I don't know if any of you have been following the news about the, the Heartbleed security vulnerability. If you haven't, go and read up about it and then go and change all of your passwords on everything. Okay, just word of advice for today. That is your afternoon sorted. Um, but uh, what that demonstrated was just how dependent we are. It also, there is a rumor that the NSA, the National Security Agency, knew about this vulnerability some time before it was made public and had been exploiting it against us instead of trying to fix the infrastructure. And that sort of thing really worries me and I think it should really worry you. But the technology can be used against us, can also be used to create freedom, to give us self-determination. The development of the internet over the past 30 years has been an astonishing triumph of engineering and of the politics of the network. That we have managed, by and large, to create an internet which remains mostly open most of the time, that remains quite hard to control and manage, and that has delivered enormous benefits to everyone. So this vast, unregulated, worldwide experiment in openness is something we should applaud, and we need to then think how we're going to use it. Now, I'd like to argue from a technical background, and a confession here, as well as having a background in philosophy, I have a computer science degree. I know, I know, but I can make eye contact, and I do talk in sentences, so it's okay to have me here. I think the principles that underpin the internet have percolated up. The fact is the internet was designed, the core internet protocols, TCP, IP, the transmission control protocol, and the internet protocol were designed by engineers, Bob Kahn and Vint Cerf, to allow the unimpeded flow of bits from one node to another. The network neither knows nor cares what those bits mean, what they count, what they stand for. It just gets them there as reliably as possible. That is a core principle of an open society the free flow of information. And I think because our computers have been linked together over the internet as an open network based on open standards, that openness has infected many of our other attitudes towards the things we do on the internet. So organizations like this, the Open Data Institute, set up uh, just over a year ago, begins from a view that certain data should be freely available to everyone to use and republish as they wish without any restrictions from, from copyrights or patents or other mechanisms of control. And I think what they're doing is reflecting, if like, a freedom agenda that is embedded in the internet, that has percolated through various organizations and is now becoming quite a fundamental political approach, model, that applies far beyond the data that is actually moved over to the internet, that is, as I say, infecting us. Organizations like Open Knowledge, and this is the Open Knowledge Foundation's new logo, by the way. Any of you who know of the Open Knowledge Foundation, they changed their name to Open Knowledge, they have a new logo, this is it. I think this might be the first time it's been used in a presentation because they only announced it yesterday, in which case you're seeing history being made. They think that the core principles revolve around availability and access, around reuse and redistribution, and around universal participation. And what they have is a manifesto. It's as much a political manifesto as anything else to say that information should be freely available, that the data should be reusable, that your use of it should not be constrained by the person who has given it to you. That means you should be able to transform it, you should be able to adapt it, you should be able to work with it, but crucially, you should also be able to distribute it and redistribute it, and the people who get it from you should be able to do those same things. Now, I would argue that that's got to be at the heart of what every librarian wants to see happen. The idea is not that we will give you knowledge, but you mustn't use it in ways we don't approve of, or that we will tell you something or give you access to resources, but you must on no account share them or tell other people what you have learned, is the fundamental principle of librarianship. We want to guide people to knowledge and understanding and let them use it in the ways they see appropriate. It is not up to us to constrain what people think or what they do with the materials. We provide it to them. And so there is a very strong, vital connection here between the open internet, open data as a, as a model, and the work of libraries, information services, everywhere. 
but it's quite a hard principle to live up to. Firstly, we need to make the argument that it's worth doing, that good things will happen if this is allowed to, to move forward. And one of the things that the open data movement certainly has been doing is promoting as many good examples of, of good practice as possible. A lot of these revolve around taking data sources, structured data, and doing visualizations of them. So here's, here's a map of planning applications in Galway that's been created from data published by a local authority and, and visualized by someone to help you find out whether they're planning to build a sewage farm or a, a mansion near your house. We know Europeana as the, as the catalog of Europe's digitized cultural assets and Europeana's data model and, and open access approach allow you to get information about the cultural treasures of Europe, uh, some of them anyway, and, and to make that available in a variety of ways. Here's a fabulous um, visualization I found of uh, shale gas um, drilling in America, looking at where it's actually happening. And you can plot that against political donations to particular companies and the, the uh, nature and uh, makeup of Congress and stuff like that, and begin to extract some very useful information about wider society. This is the, uh, the um, COD, FOD, CODFOD, a registry of humanitarian data sets. And what they're doing here is showing airports and canals and health centers in Cambodia, taking information that's been published in relatively inaccessible ways and allowing you to download it and use it for your own purposes. So if you're a humanitarian agency going into that country, you can have much better information about the infrastructure than you might otherwise have had. This was done by some friends of mine. It's called Where Does My Money Go? And it maps government spending in the UK. So you can see just how little money is actually spent on benefits for the unemployed and just how much goes to wealthy pensioners. And you may or may not choose to make a political argument on the back of that. The point is you can do what you want with it. And then there's open corporates where you can find out information about people who are directors of companies or charities and stuff like that. Again, taking information that's publicly available but may not be necessarily usable and providing it in a more usable way. The Glasgow Open Data Platform, if you, if you like, that sort of thing as well. These are obviously low-level databases, data visualizations, but they demonstrate why open data can be important. And they led to Neely Crows at last year's Open Knowledge Conference saying, this is a data revolution in the making. Now, Neely will be standing down soon because the, the commission is um, rotating, as, as you know. And I think it's going to be fascinating to see what she does next. Because when she moved from being competition commissioner to information commissioner, she suddenly revealed quite a radical bent. So any of you traveling in Europe, in the rest of Europe uh, from, from the UK, will know that within Europe now, uh, roaming charges are gradually being whittled down um, from the mobile phone companies because of the political pressure that came from Neely and her directorate. So as we go elsewhere in Europe, it's much cheaper to make phone calls or to have 3G data. So those who tell you that politicians don't make a difference, I say, yes, they do sometimes, and in a good way. If it's a revolution, though, then that's quite dangerous and worrying for many people. If it's a revolution, then you can use the things you find online without restriction to challenge received wisdom, to upset the political order, to shout fire in a crowded theatre. You can do these things, and that worries a lot of people. Because openness brings risks. The lack of control that is implicit, inherent in saying, here's this stuff, do what you want with it, means that you can't then change your mind. You can't say, oh, I didn't mean for you to do that. that. That's not what I agreed that you could do with this. If it's out under an open license, if you've taught somebody something, they can go and do it. People whose businesses rely on limiting everyone's ability to copy and modify songs or images or videos, what you call the content industries, obviously have an enormous interest in limiting the capabilities of the network and limiting the access to materials. And they build tools and architecture of control on top of the internet that allows them to monitor what people are doing. Those tools are also used by the National Security Agency. That allow them to control who can share what with whom, the digital rights management and technological protection measures, industries. And they also then become tools of oppression because they can be used by governments 
to attract dissidents, to limit the sharing of material that may be considered politically unacceptable in countries like China or Syria or the United Kingdom or North America. You know, all over the place, many, many repressive regimes around the world uh, limit your access to see stuff on the internet, like here. Um, and the system finds it hard, therefore, to cope with openness. So on one side, it's, well, surely openness is a good thing. How many of you opted out of Care Data, the, the UK, uh, the, the England and, and Health Services plan to upload all of your personal data and medical records into a centralised database so it could be mined for medical research and potentially, because it wasn't ruled out, made available to uh, insurance companies and others? Yeah. And that's a real shame because, of course, that, data bank, that database is only really valuable if we all sign up for it because it's about the mass use of, of medical records to enable us to discover where the drugs work and what treatments are effective and things like that. But we consider certain types of information about ourselves, our medical records, to be sensitive and we want to protect them. So we do need ways in which we can manage the flow of information. We need also to have campaigns where people look to see, well, maybe the boundaries are in the wrong place. So we've got Tim Gower's Boycott Elsevier campaign because he doesn't feel happy with the way Elsevier, as a publisher, manages open access. Tim's a friend of mine in Cambridge, and I know that he feels that you know, the world needs to shift, and he wants to be part of shifting it. And this is the conflict at the heart of the open data society. It's not a technical issue, and it won't be solved by technology. It's an issue of epistemology, of knowledge, of how we understand the world around us and what it is to understand the world around us and what we can do with the information that is made available to us. So you very quickly go from thinking about the network and the technology and the aspects of how things are connected to one another and how information flows through arguments about data sets and standards and formats and up into, beyond the political issues, the natures of what is it that we know, how do we know the things we know, and what can we do with the things we know. Stuart Brand is, is very famous for having said, information wants to be free. You may remember that quote. But that's only half of what he said. He actually also said, information wants to be expensive. In fact, he started by saying information wants to be expensive, but it also wants to be free, and that conflict drives us forward. And that remains as true now as it was in the 70s when he said it. That the information that drives society that we all work with has these two natures. And unless we start thinking seriously about these issues, there is a real danger that we will fail to achieve the benefits that the internet, I think, has to offer. There's a real danger that we'll end up wasting a lot of time and energy trying to control things that we don't need to control. And there's a real danger that we'll cede the space to those who would rather things were closed and limited and controlled. And this is where Karl Popper comes in, because Open Data Society and the Open Library are plays on Karl's model of the Open Society and its enemies. And when Karl Popper talked about the open society, he wasn't talking about a political system. He was talking about an approach to what a society considered possible in terms of knowledge. The open society for him is one that allows challenges to received authority, that does not assume that you just have to believe what you are told, but one that is always open to debate and question and challenge. Popper argued that totalitarianism forced knowledge to become political, which made critical thinking impossible. And he believed that led to the destruction of knowledge in totalitarian countries, like China under Mao, like Russia under Stalin. He felt that an open society had to be one that was open to challenge, that you couldn't just automatically accept the precepts of religion, you couldn't automatically say that one point of view was right or wrong, that it had to be grounded in the scientific method, in the ability to challenge. And so it's a philosophical point of view, not a political point of view. It's one that says knowledge is provisional and fallible. Science is not a way of getting it right, but a way of getting less wrong over time. And an open society is one that allows cultural and religious pluralism in as many areas as it possibly can. 
not one that is grounded in claims to certainty or the imposition of a particular version of reality where freedom of thought is repressed. Now, I think that the types of knowledge that open data makes possible and which an open internet makes shareable and which an open library makes accessible can only support the sorts of open society that Popper was concerned with. And if we actually believe in opening data, if we believe in these principles, then we are inevitably at the same time arguing for a Popperian open society and that, that carries with it political challenges because there will be people who resist it. I don't want to argue that an open society is a good society. I don't think that you couldn't build an evil society on open principles. I just think it would be hard for a closed society to be a good one. So saying I think things should be open doesn't mean I inevitably believe they will be better. I just think that if we allow things to be closed, they will inevitably be worse. So it's an argument not to say this solves our problem, but that we need to be having the debate within this sphere in order to have any chance of making a difference. The relationship between technologies and social structures is too complex and too, ris uh, too rich to be simplified too much. And I don't want to claim that. What I do think, though, is that an open society that seeks to deliver equality of opportunity, social justice, and free expression is more likely to be better and more likely to be more stable if it's grounded in technologies which are themselves open and if it attempts to adhere to the open data principles as far as possible. It needs to be a society within which questions can be asked and critical thinking is not just permitted but encouraged and where investigation and not ideology is seen as the basis for finding out the truth about the world. And this shouldn't be that controversial, but it is. We see all over the place instances in which the control of data, the control of information, is being used to lock out scientific investigation. It's being used to control what people do. And that's not just in the era of politics. You may have seen the recent revelations about Tamiflu, that Tamiflu as an antiviral doesn't actually seem to be effective. Um, and this only became apparent because Roche were persuaded to release the results of some trials which they had not previously made available that had, by their absence, distorted the overall assessment. So here we see a very clear example of where the corporate interests of closed data were being served, uh, well, Roche's interests were being served by closing data, and that we all, as a society, benefit from having more open data. We could decide to go down the path that allows closure. Uh, in Iran, a couple of years ago, they, have been they started constructing what they call a halal internet, a contained network similar to the Chinese Great Firewall of China, which limits what um, Iranian citizens can see to material that has been approved. And the fact is that we can, if we want, re-engineer the internet to be a lot more closed than it currently is. The fact that it is currently very open is contingent. There's no essential quality to a network to say that it has to be open. We just happen to have built it that way back in the 1970s and 80s and built on top of what was open and are now, I think, taking, reaping the benefits of that openness. But it doesn't have to stay that way. We could limit, manage access by building in technologies of control to the internet, and many people would probably quite like to see that happen. I think it would be a mistake. But there's another, and I think actually much bigger danger for the open internet and the open network and open data. It's not just those who don't think data should be open. It's also those who would abuse the freedom that open offers and use it against us. So I like to think that the political argument for openness is unassailable, that the benefits that come to society are so clear 
that the ways in which we can use it to make the world a better place are demonstrable, that the political arguments get... I happen to believe that we can win that fight and retain the open internet and an open society. The real danger comes from those who take that open data and use it against us. And there are many examples of that, but one of the most obvious is Facebook. Facebook does not, is not a website. Facebook is Facebook. It sits on top of the internet. It uses free software and open standards and open data. It relies on the open internet in order to give us the opportunity to drop our information into it and then we never see it again. Facebook is a black hole when it comes to the open internet because once you try to, once you put something in there, they will work very hard to keep it. Have you ever tried, if you're on Facebook, sharing a post or a link from within the Facebook mobile app? If you see something you like and you click share, your options are write post on Facebook or send us a message to another Facebook user. You have no way of putting it onto the open net. You have no way of extracting a dereferenceable URI for that content that would allow you to share it in an open way. Facebook is locking those options away from you because it wants you to live and remain within the Facebook ecosystem. The ability to appropriate open data runs very deep, and that's because it's part of the characteristics of open data. People can do what they want with it. If one of the things they want to do with it is use it within a closed ecosystem, well, you said you can. So we don't have an argument from principle to stop people doing that. And the fact is that Facebook provides a very attractive walled garden, and a lot of us choose to spend a lot of time there, and it has enormous affordances and benefits. So it's not that Facebook is wrong, it's more that what it's doing demonstrates that we can't rely on internet technologies to embed our values. I don't actually think the internet can be held to have those values, really. I said it's built on an approach of openness, that technology is itself open, and that it has affected the thinking of many other people and many other areas. But I wouldn't want to make the argument that the internet itself is essentially open, because I don't think the internet or any piece of technology is essentially anything. Asking what is the, you know, is, this, uh, is the internet open, doesn't seem to take you anywhere useful. It's like Wittgenstein's old comment about what is a table, you know? I've had a picnic on Wittgenstein's grave, does that make it a table? Well, technically, according to him, it probably would. What makes something open data? What are its characteristics? Well, they're their patterns of use. The thing that makes something open is how it is used. And if it's used in open ways, we can call it open. We need to avoid, therefore, talking about the politics of the net. I think we need to talk about politics through the net. I think we need to accept that it is, in the end, up to all of us. If we believe in certain principles about how open data can be used to support an open society and about the place of the library in that open society to go and do something about it. There are international bodies like the IGF trying to sort out the governance of the internet at the moment and we can engage with them. But we can also just decide to make use of whatever comes out of those discussions and that debate. We decide to resist measures to abuse the freedom of the internet in things like the PRISM program. We can say that we don't consider it acceptable for governments to be monitoring and watching. Librarians have a greater sense of the importance of the privacy of what you read and what you look at and what you surf than almost any other group of people. And that's a principle that needs to be maintained online. And we need to argue against those who think we should just be able to watch everything everyone does. And we need to work actively in an engaged way to make this open data society. We need to recognize that it will be a long process and we are at best laying the foundations at the moment. That the, transform the transformation of the internet is occasioned to the ways we think is enormous, 
but we still haven't fully embedded it into all the areas of our lives, everything we do. We need to stand together, those of us who believe in open data and the open society, so that it can't be taken away and use those services that are currently available in the best possible way to demonstrate its effectiveness and its importance. We have to stand up against those who would take open data and lock it away. At London Book Fair last week, um, Penguin Random House launched their My Independent Bookshop. This is a really interesting initiative where you can share online 12 books that you think people should read and it links through to independent bookshops and it sounds really nice, but the question that's not being asked is, how do I get my data out of it? If I use this service for a year and I recommend lots of books in it, how can I export my data in an open format so I can take it somewhere else? Can I have my social graph back after you finish making money out of it, please? And these sort of questions need to be asked at the point where these systems are being designed and built, not later down the line. The fact is, as somebody pointed out, sending your library users to Google Scholar sounds great until Google decides to close Google Scholar as they have closed so many other services in the past and you are left completely stranded. So putting your faith in these services may well be a bit risky. And it may be better to support the open source, open initiatives. This is one example, Fix My Street, built by some friends of mine at my society, which have a community behind them rather than a multi-billion dollar US corporation whose interests are not your interests behind them. So it's not a case of doing it for yourself. It's doing it with your friends and colleagues and those who share your interests and building something that can be sustained over the long term instead of just signing up for a commercial service that may not be there tomorrow. If we want open libraries, if we want to support an open society, we actually have to put the effort into it. It will not just happen. We need to understand the complexities, we need to understand the risks, we need to realise that we cannot control everything that is done with the data we make available to people, and that this is a good thing. But teachers have known this forever, and librarians understand it too, so it's not a hard stretch. But we're building an infrastructure, we're building systems that will support people, societies, humanity going forward. Assuming we don't actually, we haven't completely messed up the planet, and we actually managed to hold the biosphere together for another 50 or 100 years, then the network is going to be everywhere. Access to information is going to be more and more important. As we digitise the past and bring it into the network, we're going to need ways to explore it and work with it. And I think the open principles, the open definition, provide a very sound and solid and important basis for moving forward. In the end, though, it comes down to working together and being generous. And somewhat ironically, I'd chosen this final slide some time ago, and then I noticed that the strap line for Google Scholars was standing on the shoulders of others. And I was thinking about standing on the seashore and yeah, looking out of the sea and standing on the shoulders of others. I just don't think Google Scholar necessarily is the best way to do it. I do think it's important to stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, to share what we know, to work together to make the world a better place one in which the network is important, but in which we never let go of our essential humanity, our desire for knowledge and comradeship. Thank you.